Welcome to Verbal Pick Radio, where we give you a verbal image of life, and we are everyday people like to welcome you all to the show. Uh, today's show it, it, is, is, it, it is inspired by a melanin, the term of use of being black, the term in use of being white as far as race, uh, and also the term of more uh, as a, a nationality or as what we all should be calling ourselves uh, in dealing with race. We're going to touch bases on all of this so we can give a clear understanding to those that are familiar with these terms and has been uh, using and identifying with these terms. We want to give you a background dealing with these terms, right? But I have uh, a good friend on the phone that uh, we glad to have him back on the show who always uh, drops his science, and we appreciate that. But Brother Low Key, I'd like to welcome you to the show. What's going on, God? Oh man, you know we we finna we finna dive into it, right? But before we dive into it, I just want to read this uh, to the people. So because I've been talking about melanin and melanin for the past, I guess week, right? And I just want to give them a basis, and and it says that melanin has gone from being a simple solar filter to be the central molecule of life. Any changes that occur inside the cell or the organism as a whole, it depends entirely on the chemical energy that emanates from the melanin. In the form of molecular hydrogen and high energy electrons, the approximately 7,000 chemical reactions already described in the literature about cellular metabolism will have to be rethought based on the energy of melanin and not glucose. The glucose molecule, without the presence of the energy of the melanin, it would be an inert uh, molecule or even more. It would not even exist because of the formation of the glucose, which is an exact process requires quite requires uh, quite exact energies like those that come from the melanin. The way in which the melanin uh, dissociates and reassociates the water molecule that is liquid gas could be represented as zero and one like a binary code which a bond in nature therefore it is impossible that the melanin not only delivers energy but also information right melanin delivers energy Information and it is one of the oldest substances or chemicals known to man, right? And out of that melanin, here comes life, right? Now, through the span of time, right, other cultures is is, is evolving on this planet. Uh, we say through grafting, right? Through the process, you get different races, right? But now here we are in 2020. But prior to that, we went from Negro to colored to African American as what we are called today. But there's other terms that needs to be addressed. Terms such as um, more uh, and we're dealing basically on the more, but um, I, I like for you to give a um, definition in a sense of us calling ourselves black and white people call themselves white. What do those terms act actually mean? Yeah, in in regards to uh, into in regards to identifying. Uh, 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 of race, the black race or white race. Right. So the white race you can look up Google Federal Directive Number Fifteen on the dot gov site, and it'll let you know that white is classified based on the federal government of the 
the United States. Has any of the original peoples of North Africa, Europe, or the Middle East, which we know that the people that are commonly referred to as white, they're not the original people of any of these particular locations. We know about the... Before you had the Greeks, you had the Etruscans. We know about the Phoenicians. We know about the Druid people who, you know, uh, resided in what's now known as Ireland, so on and so forth. And then when it comes to black racial classification, they, and I'm paraphrasing, is any uh, group of people from basically sub-Saharan Africa. Right. You know, so they're saying South Saharan saying that, you know, to make a distinction between North Africans, which is on the Sahara, the answer is that is in North Africa, and they're saying that black people are sub Saharan, so they don't fall in the category of North Africa. You know, there are, so in other words, what they're saying is that any group of people that come from a, a slave African group, that's literally what black means is identifying a group of people that don't have a land mass that they're connected to because of slavery. So black, uh, whenever you mark it down on your contracts, your applications, you're, you're literally telling uh, the company that you come from a slave group of people. Literally, that's exactly what black means. Right. Now, let me ask you this. Now, can, and can, they, can, they, can they be saying the adverse that since... Middle East, Mecca, and Egypt were places of knowledge. Could, are they saying that the places where knowledge emanates from are known, are, are, are known, they classify that as white, as they highlight Egypt and they highlight Morocco and they highlight Mecca, where knowledge is, they say that's white. And then the, the places that they don't highlight, even though the first universities in Timbuktu and whatnot, they don't highlight that. They call that black as far as they trying to say that they are, are they trying to tie themselves into knowledge? What they're doing is they're trying to tie themselves into more state. And I want to go back a little bit because uh, what I said actually wasn't precise. Uh, by and large, they, whenever, I, uh, whenever they're talking about black, it is referring to a slave group of people, but black also falls under, you know, Jamaicans and, you know, certain other countries, people that actually have a national origin that may not have necessarily been caught up in the slave trade. So I just wanted to put some clarification on that. Now, back to the term white is the reason why they're identifying North Africa is because the Moors taught them. The Moors uh, cl- uh, cleaned them up in year from 711 A.D. to 1492 when the last Moors stronghold fell in Grenada. So, you know, whenever you look up these pictures of when you go on Google and you type in presidents, uh, uh, presidents that are Shriners or presidents and Shriners, then you'll see these presidents with the fans on, which the Moors are known for, also known as the Tar Bush. You know, um, also you see... Uh, Anglo people with the last name Moore, M-O-O-R-E. You also see them with the name Morris, M-O-R-R-S, excuse me, M-O-R-R-I-S, which if you look up the definition of Morris, it means Morris with the H at the end. If you look up Moore with the E at the end, it's going to tell you that it means Moore, M-O-O-R. So, you know, these people, man, they have an infatuation with the people that uh, cleaned them up, that raised them up, that gave them knowledge, that taught them, you know, how to stand up right, you know, and once, you know, the war started occurring between the Moors and the Anglos, which uh, also was referred to as a, a, a war between the Christians and the Muslims, uh, <clears throat> they, uh, I was about to lose, but to lose my train of thought, mm-hmm. uh, was talking about the, them the- taking over the trade routes. That's where I was going with it, is okay. that. Uh, the wars was that the Anglos, they were fighting to take over the trade routes because the Moors were traveling internationally and setting up trade posts. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, so yeah, even the Phoenicians, the Phoenicians were known for, and within their namesake, 
means purple because they were trading in purple dye. That was something that they were known for. And the Phoenicians and the Moors are the exact same thing. If you look into the uh, Dictionary of Races of Peoples that was published by the United States Immigration Commission, it'll tell you that Moor is synonymous with, with Phoenicians. Okay. You know, Phoenician, Phoenician colonists, just to be exact. But And it also says that Moors are uh, people with Negro blood, uh, Berbers and Arabs, which all three of those terms are talking about the same people because originally Arab is not what people, uh, commonly think of as an Arab today. Originally that was dark people. That's why you can look at old dictionaries and they'll, uh, they'll refer to as an Arab as a, as, uh, some, a dark, a dark skinned person. Right. You yeah. Know? So, right. or, or even black man. I think I've even seen Arab described as black man, mm -hmm. but. Uh, it's been said that Arab comes from the term mer meta or mari or mari, excuse me. Let me spell that. M-A-R-A-P or M-A-R-A-A-B. Okay. You know, so Arab literally means more because Marab and, uh, means more, the term itself. So you're just talking about, all talking about the same people. Right, right, right. Because the, the, the Arab, right, was the Arab derived from the, the trap, the international traveling more. Mm -hmm. Right. It, it, cor, cor, that, right. Exactly. Now, that's, and I just want to add one thing. Mm -hmm. This is a very key point about the Arabs because one of that is the Morris culture is that it puts Hellify emphasis on the study of law and legality. So one of the advantages of this is that when it comes to history, the history teachers are not necessarily speaking from a lawful or legal perspective. They're not necessarily including that into their dialogue. So when I go on these channels, I see a lot of good historical information, but because they're not including the law information, it's not as precise when it comes to exactly what was going on and getting into the details. Because one thing about the law is that it's word for word. So when you type up an affidavit, every word that is used within the affidavit is of importance because law is very precise, you know. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to whenever you hear people talk about Arab conquest and the Arabs did this and the Arabs did that, they need to be very specific about one particular nation, if it was a, a clan or a tribe with just a smaller group of people within a, a nation of people, they need to be specific about that. And they need to even be uh, specific about the phenotype, if you will. Because sometimes when you talk about Arab, it could just be, you know, uh, the equivalent of a lot, uh, a group of people that are large skin, uh, uh, excuse me, light skin and dark skin, uh, African people, you know, so, you know, this going around, you know, when I first came into knowledge itself, you know, they, you know, it was common to hear about Arab conquest and, you know, I identified it with the people that most people think of, think of them to be. Right. But once I learned that Moors also consisted of Arabs, now that this has to change the whole narrative about what's going on, you know, so we got to be specific when we're talking about things that happen in history and we cannot be specific in teaching history if we do not include the law the, from a lawful perspective or from a legal perspective. It's just no way to do it. Right, right. There's just no way to do it. You're you're just you're not including the treaty, you're not including, you know, why the treaties was happening because they were making treaties with the with the nations that was especially when you're talking about the Moors that was bodying them. You know, they wasn't doing treaties with, with nations that wasn't actually putting up a fight. You know, so while you got some people that like to throw, you know, the Moors or whoever else under the bus, you know, these are some of the people that was actually putting up a fight to the bitter end. Well, you know, yeah. not to mention the first people that was actually enslaved for the first, you know, one to 200 years. Right. Of our Moors. Right. Before they even went into some of the, the more southern parts of Africa. But, but that that's true. But the, but, but the, the Moors was, was rulers that, <laughs> one point and they were signing treaties to protect other smaller nations such as United States of America. You know, the the, the Sultan of Morocco, which I, I I can't remember his name right off hand. But he Yeah, not not to not to protect them, but because they was at war with them, that was an agreement in order 
if they were trying to protect anything, it was their people that was getting bodied in the wars or that was become prisoners well, of war. Right, but but wasn't it? Because they, they, they definitely weren't trying to protect the U.S. They was at war with them. Even the Moors in the Philippines was at war with the United States in the 1900s. So, so it's it's an ongoing thing. Right, so it, it wasn't true that uh, when the, the American ships was in the water, they was constantly getting raided by pirates. So they looked to be up under, uh, I guess, the, I don't, I guess, looked to be up under protection of the Moors to make sure that they ships was traveling back and forth without being harmed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not in the protection of it, just an agreement that, right. hey, you know, we're on these waters. Some of the Moors are taking over ships, getting all their resources up, and vice versa, from the Muslim side to the Christian side, because, you know, that's also, you know, needs to be a, a key point in the narrative when we're talking about this, is that to this day, and, you know, me, you, Jamal, and, and Gino, I've been discussing this, is to this day, the United States is at war with everybody that, that they're currently at war with right now right. are... There are Islamic groups that are a part of every single nation where they have, where they just set up shop and they've got an ongoing war going on. Right. So this war between Muslims and Christian, the Muslim nation and the Christian nation, because when back then it was so, it was so many Muslims before a lot of the conversion happened where you had, you know, Moors, i.e. African people were getting converted into Christianity that Muslim was such a common term because there were so many of us, you know, so Muslim was synonymous with Moors, and Christian right. was synonymous with Anglo, where Anglo people are, i.e. European people. Right. You know, so this this war between, you know, Moors and Christians has been going on for a very, very long time, hundreds of right. years. Right. But but the thing that the thing that always has me at yeah, all, no, right, is that like you said, the Moors could be at war with the United States, but still, uh, will create a treaty or a an agreement, just like with the Knights of Malta, uh, the Moors during the Crusade Wars, the Moors allowed them to set up hospitals and and, and con- con- convents and you know uh, uh, and churches, and and allowed them to help. And allowed them to help heal the sick during wartime. You know, it's just like uh-huh. as a Muslim, if we in the battle and I'm battling a Christian, but he comes and gives me the greetings, then I give him refuge for a time being as long as he's under my uh, authority. But once he leaves, the war is back on. But that's the difference between how the Muslims treated uh, their adversaries, I guess, in war versus the way the Christians treated the adversaries. When the Christians, they killed everything. There was no agreement, or we, or, or, or if the if the Christians, if they were the one had authored the treaty, they they saw that as a way to break the treaty. They didn't keep not one treaty that they um that they agreed to with the the natives in the Americas. Mm-hmm. You know, and I say yeah. that point. Huh? Mm-hmm. No, I was saying, and I make that point to try to give the people a vision of the of the two types of mindsets. You know, one is trying to be upright, and the other is not honoring or respecting what uprightness is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's a it's a couple of things. I want to add to that. One, it goes back to what I was mentioning earlier about the importance of specificity. So, you know, because just like the term black today refers to so many nations of people, you know, uh, people from various parts of Africa, people in Jamaica, people in Haiti, you know, this is a blanket term. So let's say, you know, someone were to say that, well, black people, they gave refuge to, you know, white people. Well, what group of black people are we talking about? You talking about Haitians, Jamaicans, or you talking about Africans? I mean, right. you talking about people in America? I mean, what black people are you talking about? So the same thing applies to Moors, because Moors was just as common as of a term as black is today. 
So it could have been the Moriscos, which were Moors that were converted mm. from uh, Islam or or right. whatever spiritual system to Christianity. Right. You know, funny. so right. specificity is so 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 crucial because you know that's somebody could throw black people. They could generalize about black people and try to put all black people in the same boat. But depending on you know that's that's why I said you know that if you're talking about Haiti, we know that the Haitians. They fall for their independence. Right. So they can't be put into the box that they were, you know, uh, under, you know, necessarily following the same, um, you know, protocol as black people as a whole. You know, so specificity is crucial. We've got to be specific about what particular group of people, tribe or clan that we're talking about. Well, we, we Whenever we talk about more. Well, that's you know, true. Where we get that from is... This term called the Akashic Records, right? Because we can go back before Pangea, before the tectonic plates and the split took place, when you had one ruling kingdom, whether you're going back to Mali or the Nubia or Kush or Egypt, or even prior to that to where we can remember where we was just in this location and it was just us, before we branched out and start naming our, giving ourselves different names. You know, before the Egyptian, it was the Nubian. You know? And so, you got some of us who, in our subconscious, goes back to that constant record and, and still bring forth in this, this day and time of we are one. Right? But right. You, but you write. In the reality, though, we have different cultures, different languages, you know, and different ideologies, you know. And so, yes, okay, yeah. But the but the common yeah. denominator is is that. But the thing about it is is that that but that colonizer he saw us as one. I mean, look at. Uh, Amadou Diallo in New York when they shot him about 41 times he was uh, coming out of uh, I believe it was West Africa they didn't know the difference you see what I'm saying uh, when they, they shoot brothers down in the white well, he don't he not he don't take the time to say your geographical location or you know your terminology uh, he 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 just sees that melanin and different shades and it and he attacks it and so some is saying well you know what if we all come together around the globe we outnumber them and we stand a better chance being united as one but of course you know uh with so many different languages and cultures you like that is hard to do that is hard to do that's that could be wishful thinking, brother. I don't know, man. You right, but so you talk, you because I missed one piece of what you were saying. The phone and yeah. went out a little bit just on my end. Um, mm-hmm. You said what well, what could be considered wishful thinking? You were talking about uh, unity. Yeah, I was t- talking about unity in the sense of due due to the different cultures and languages, um, do uh, and and the. No, no. The different cultures and the language and the poison that the colonizer had went to all, uh, majority, all areas on this planet and poisoned the doctrine. And, and look, you got Brazil, got a big old white statue of Jesus standing over them. You got missionaries that go in Africa who, after they come out of Africa, they got the African... Africans want to use bleaching cream. You got you got one common colonizer, i.e. enemy, and their own code when they go to these places. You know, I we I look we said that in. I don't know if you saw uh, the the comedian Lou Neal. She was on Vlad's show and she was speaking on Nick Cannon, right? But mm-hmm. Vlad stayed on code. He wasn't going to agree 
or with anything that even seemed remotely like it was against white folks and Jews. Right, because he's a Jew himself. He's just, so he on code. Which is the, which is the creed, which is a part of a nation. A nation is a nation, uh, is a body of people, a flag, and a creed. Okay, so he's part of a creed. And Jew and and, and Jewish people are just, uh, regardless of their national origin, they may be German or what have you. That is a identification of their religion, which sometimes religion can is synonymous with race. That's why you know I had mentioned earlier that. Christians, whenever you refer to as a person as a Christian, that's that's what people would call white people today. Right. So if we saw a white person back during those times, we would say, Oh, that's a Christian. Right. And if they seen somebody like us, they would they would uh uh racial profilers and say that, oh, that's a Muslim. Oh, so the black so, Christians don't have a flag. Well you have uh I think you have nations at this time that are their religion, their dominant uh, their creed is, is Christianity, and I mean America. Be considered a, in America, right? You said that the black Christians have what? Don't have a flag. No, black people don't have a flag. In the in the RBG flag, the uh, Pan African flag hasn't gone through the proper steps in order for it to become an official flag that be, that can be used on an international level to mm. do. Uh, to start politicking and, and getting allies for, you know, our people here on this particular soil. So there's only two flags then that America has for black people. That's the Moorish flag, and that's the flag of the Nation of Islam. When you say creed. Mm-hmm. Now let me ask you this. Is that Moorish flag, is that the symbol for all Moorish sex? More sex? Well, you know, you have more than different places on the planet that have their own flag. Okay. Like if you talk about the the uh, Moro Islamic Liberation Front in the Philippines, and and um, I think the other group is called the National Moro Liberation Front in the Philippines. They have their own flags there. Okay. You know, now they have more symbols on there. Like I have one on my wall from the Philippines. It's like a uh, scimitar type of sword. Right. that the Moors were commonly uh, known to use. And also, I want to mention this, just as a side note, a couple of things is, one, I had a Filipino co-worker. Every time I come across a Filipino person, I ask them about the Maros in Mindanao. Right. And even, the, even the, the way that I even found out about Mindanao was from talking to Philippines. They identified a location to where they're commonly known to be, and I went and did my research. This is after I had already been, you know, did a heavy study on them some mm-hmm. years back. And so I'm talking to this Filipino lady and I asked her about the Maros and she said, uh, she said, Oh, you talking about the terrorists? Yeah. And, and I said, uh, I said, Oh yeah. I said, that's interesting. I'm, I'm going to paraphrase what my response to her was. I said, uh, and she asked me, well, how did you know about them? Mm-hmm. And I said, well, you know, people, that look like me are identified as terrorists in America. So, you know, a person who understands that they're identified as such, uh, they may uh, be interested in studying other people who are identified as a terrorist in their uh, whatever country that they reside. So so we got common ground in that sense. She calling them a terrorist, and I'm like, well, that's what they call me over here. That's right. (laughs) Yeah. Right. So I started looking at her sideways from that day forward. You know, now the other thing I wanted to mention was um, the the Marabou people coming coming out of Africa. Mm. Whether it's spelled with a T, it's M A R uh, A B O U, and sometimes you see it with the T. Okay. Now, these people are not spoken upon as much. These were Moors uh, that originated in Africa that were over in Haiti. And a lot of the fighting that was going on during the Haitian Wars were these Moors people that was in Haiti that was that was bodying, you know, the invaders, the mm-hmm. Anglo invaders, right. you know, the European invaders. So I just want to add that little piece because that doesn't get included in a lot of the conversations when people talk about Moors. They don't know about the Marabou people in Haiti. Right. You know, how they was getting down with the get down and they weren't backing down. Okay. And so whenever people say the Moors are sellouts, 
Who you talking about? That's right. like if somebody saying black people are sellouts. Right. Who you talking about? Right. You know, you, because I don't, I don't rock with no sellouts, and I know plenty of black people. That's right. So I don't, you know, people just throwing these, these blanket terms out, and they don't know what the fuck they talking about. Right. And it's, you a, know? And it's impossible, bro. It's impossible for Moors to be a sellout. Because their movement was based on, it was analytical, and it was based on mathematics and, and science to get from point A to point B mathematically. So whatever the climate was or the era of time was, then it uh, dictated the move. So the move was true in that time and era. But if you would make the same move in 2020, of course not, because we are, we in, we in, we in a different dispensation of time. You know, that's why I say what was true back then may not be true today, but yet it's still truth. You know what I mean? So, you know, you right, right, and, and uh-huh. no, I'm listening, but I'm listening. Just to add on to what you're saying is that. Uh, Yes, there were certain moves that were made by certain Moorish nations, but while this was going on, this still doesn't account for Moors worldwide because one nation doesn't necessarily agree with all of the political moves of the next nation. Right. So I wanted to add that piece as right. well. Well, well, because we we so used to having a a a, king, a leader, we you know a pharaoh. And then the pharaoh has his body of politics or his his court. And then from there, from that court, then information and knowledge and rules and, and, and decrees goes out to the the body the, 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 the body of people. But I think as we move forth in time that kind of split up and we broke off into to, to tribes and sections. Right? Then, but the thing about when we broke off into tribes and sections was it was easier for the colonizer to, to pit, to divide and conquer. And then he, that's how he gained control. So what we're saying today in 2020, because the reason why Brother Loki is I got a lot of people that's curious about Moors, curious about Islam and Muslims, because they hear it. You know, you got to realize, you know, people such as ourselves, we woke up early. You got folks who are just now waking up. And so they they hearing a lot of verbiage on nationality, more black, you know, so and so and. And that's why, you know, I like having you on the show because you can see it in a way to where those who just waking up, they understand it, that way they can make a choice for themselves. They, they, they're just saying, okay, Moors, flags, nationality, okay, they did this, they did that, okay, well, uh, is there a problem with them caught identifying themselves as black people? Now, only reason why I said it is because melanin was referred to as black. Even Moors was referred to as black. Then you got Adam and Aramaic was referred to as black. And also Aswad was black. And Yunda was green, which was referred to as black. Triple darkness was still going back to as black. But the Caucasian took that term and changed the narrative and turned it into a negative. So, how do we... Uh, I mean, put it like this, put it like this. The, 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 the last thing that I would ever want to do was make someone feel ashamed of who they are based upon titles. Because... Through the Willie Lynch doctrine and everything, you know, I done seen it personally from the lightest to the darkest where they was ashamed of their hue. 
And I'm saying it be proud that you got melanin in your body because that was the first substance that created life, right? So this is more encouragement to those who don't know. Can they be proud to call themselves black even though in this society black is frowned upon? Oh, can they be proud? Yes. <clears throat> so that goes to this. Real important key note here is that black and white has absolutely nothing, to, as a racial classification, has mm-hmm. absolutely nothing to do with skin complexion. Okay. And the reason why they, they use black, or one of the reasons why they use white and black, and specifically black, is because they knew that our people would identified with skin complexion because that's the way that it was put out there. Okay. So we could look at, y'all could go on Google and you could look up Mustafa Hefty and look up his case. He's a brother that looked just like me and Brother Black that was from Egypt, which is North Africa. Right. And he was classified, legally classified as white. Right. And he has been in this fight and I think he's in the fight to this day. He mm-hmm. asked for people to help him get lawyers and mm-hmm. I think he's been fighting this fight for like 30, 40 years. You right. Know, I think since the 80s. Right. He's been trying to get identified as black right. and he's still identified as white. Right. And it ain't got absolutely nothing to do with his skin complexion. It's a status. Right. It's a status in law. Right. <clears throat> and something that also separates people who are connected to a land and have uh that are descendable you know because land is tied in the heritage and resources that could be passed down your right. even your last name and your namesake you know all these things are tied into what's actually descendable mm-hmm. you know so a lot of the emotionalism that's tied into blackness is because people think it has something to do with their skin complexion right. and that's just a hundred percent false has absolutely nothing to do with your skin tone yeah. You know, so, yeah. um, if, and then it goes back to something I think I mentioned in another podcast is that let's say, you know, I'm just, you know, I ain't going to get deep into the, you know, metaphysical aspect of it, but let's, let's just say for the second conversation that we originally came from the planet Mars mm-hmm. and let's say that we, uh, amongst each other, you know, we refer to each other as Martians. So, then, you know, we're dealing with contracts and we're doing, you know, international business or domestic business and applications. And, you know, even though, you know, we're proud to be from Mars and we refer to each other as Martians, if we were to put on a contract that our race is Martians because we're emotionally attached to the namesake, but if that particular identification uh, has no standing in law, and, you know, holds no weight, then what would be the incentive for the action to put it down on application if it's non-beneficial, if it's just something that a group of people are emotionally attached to because they think it, they think it has something to do with their skin complexion or just something that they refer to each other in private conversation, but you're dealing with public documents. So mm-hmm. what we refer to each other on the private side of things, and this is something I learned in law too, is the difference between private side and public side, we got to separate the two. Mm-hmm. We can refer to each other as whatever we want to refer to each other. We can call each other niggas, black, uh, extraterrestrials. But when it comes to doing business, there is a particular protocol on the international level when it comes to do, when it comes to doing business. And African nations follow behind this, the same type of guidelines. You know, there may be slight differences whenever you, you know, talk about uh, whether it's the African Union or the United Nations and so on and so forth, but there is a general protocol. So once again, you know, going back, people just need to understand it has nothing to do with skin complexion and we got to get out of the emotionalism and we got to get into business. And that's one thing. Another thing that uh, Morris culture has to offer is that it's business centered. And our, that's one of the things that are, and, and it also creates a certain kind of mindset and language when it comes to doing business. So the language, some of the things that I've been speaking on in this particular podcast is coming from the language of law. You know, so just as, you know, Brother Jamal speaks on the importance of 
language and how languages are connected. Mm-hmm. Law and legalities has a language uh, uh, is a language itself, whether you want to call it legalese or, or, or what have you. So this is a language that black people get killed on a regular basis in a court because they don't know how to speak the language. So they go into court and they get bodied and next thing you know, they're in the jail cell doing life. Wow. You know, free Jennifer Jeffley, free, free to our, our sister Jennifer Jeffley. Wow. You know, so having this, you know, particular language incorporated in our culture is something that's missing. It cannot just be pushed to the side because it's a piece of the puzzle that's missing. That's you right. know, so I just want to add that as well. No, no, brother. That exactly, I, exactly. You that that's very important uh, language in law. You know, because uh, especially dealing with the interpretation, you can be off. You know, dealing with these people because. You have to understand, really, meaning uh, they're not going to give you any mercy or leeway if you don't know. So, and speaking on the Jennifer Jeffrey case, um, those of you all, please go back and research that case. Sign the petition on change.org, and we're still in the process of freeing our sister. But, Brother Low Key, man, I, I appreciate you putting it in a way to where those who listening can understand and uh, apply apply this knowledge to better themselves. It's a, it's a spark, you know, uh, and I appreciate you creating the spark because people want information and, and they want knowledge. And as you know, this type of knowledge is not taught in the public school system. So for you to Take your time and dig and extract this knowledge and then share it or rain down the knowledge upon the people. Uh, that's a gift. That's that's also called uh, you zakat or charity that you're giving back to your people. And for those who wake up, research and understand that to the good thing that I like, whether uh, you say more or Muslim is, as you stated one time that there is a duty, a responsibility, a way to be if you call yourself a more um, or a Muslim, you know. So yes, sir. Yeah, and that's, yes, sir. And it's, and it's no. I'm listening, but one more piece that I want to add, and I know I have probably talked about this on another podcast, but I'm gonna keep on saying it because it's so key to my brothers and sisters that are Morris Americans. And to anybody who was looking at that particular movement, I'm a Moor and I am in solidarity with Morris Americans, but I do not refer to myself as a Morris American or, a, or an American period. I'm a Moor. Now, reason being is because once again, specificity. If you go to the Treaty of Peace and Friendship, Morris American is nowhere in that particular document. Right. It talks about all Moors. Now, Morris Americans are considered Moors, but still, just for the sake of law, specificity is crucial because of the way things can be perceived by the masses of people. Mm-hmm. So, you know, for example, if you have people that have knowledge itself and they start learning about the Moors, and they see, you know, a lot of these Moors, they call themselves Moors Americans. Perhaps the first thing they're going to say is they sound like some sellouts. Right. Why are they calling themselves Americans? Right. Well, we know that people who make up the conscious community and people who have knowledge of self, we removed ourselves from those particular type of titles. And we're in this end, you know, as we gain more ground moving towards sovereignty, we get further and further away from things that happen because of colonialism and the triangular slave trade right. throughout time. Right. And also, most Americans are flying the U.S. flag. said it before. You know, they're doing this because of, you know, uh, you know, peace be upon Prophet Noble Drew Ali. You know, he put on a demonstration. I think he was alive long enough to put on his demonstration for about three years or so. And so he didn't have a long time for him to go through natural evolution and the upgrade of his demonstration. He did an exemplary job 
you know, for the time that he was down here. But over, you know, a hundred years later, we can't think that, you know, it's okay to be stagnant and not upgrade and add on to the lesson and the demonstration that he put forth. So the flying of the U.S. flag today is, uh, you know, should be known and void and should, should be something that is discarded of. You know, we understand that, you know, uh, people like us fall under, uh, you know, a certain, by and large, we fall under U.S. citizenship. So we don't have to fly a flag or call ourselves American for that to be an actual fact. Now, mm-hmm. shout out to the Moors who expatriated and became for a national. I understand that you have Moors here on this particular soil that uh, have implemented that as well. You know, so yes, we all have solidarity as Moors, but there are things that we need to discard of. And that American title and that U.S. flag are the number one things that we need to discard of, we need to get rid of, and we need to leave that in the early 1900s. It's 2020, and we got to upgrade and stop being, uh, you know, uh, religious zealots and be, and stop being dogmatic and stop being people worshipers and stop being worshipers, period and start being gods and goddesses and titans and the great old ones and all that, you know, pro, you know all these primordial titles that we know that we are. We got to we gotta step our game up, Morris, you know, because because people are watching. People are watching, man. And, you know, y'all got some of y'all Morris are being called sellouts because of the type of demonstration that you're putting on. And I'm saying as a more who then, I just did it all. You know, I that, that might be a whole other show, but when it comes to being a more, I've been ran up on by police. You know, I didn't, I didn't, you know, missed out on so much money. I didn't been to, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't hear written documents and read ink in front of a judge and got him to sign off on it in court. I mean, I didn't fought against the U.S. courts on the private side. I didn't have process service come to my house. I had police that was parked down the street that I walked up on. They drove off as soon as I got close to that vehicle. So I'm a more that got stripes in the game. And I'm telling you that this American title and this flag is something that needs to be discarded of. So I rest. I just wanted to say that for the record. Man, well, well said. Well said, because that's going to spark study. You know, and those who know what you're saying is true, it's going to put fire to their feet as well, brother. Man, appreciate yes, it, bro. Sir. Yeah, well, I, I appreciate yes, your insight. And before we get out of here, is there anything you'd like to say or add uh, for the listening audience? Uh, uh, yeah, we good. We good. We we cover we cover some good ground today. Yeah, man, we, we cover excellent ground. And I'd like to uh, give a shout out to Quavion Moore uh, for inspiring the the, the topic. Uh, to put out information dealing with the Moors because, as you stated, people are looking and a lot of people want to know. Verbal Prick Radio, we are. Oh, oh, oh. Yes, sir. Oh, Black. Yes, sir. Well, just one, one last piece. I <laughs> just, just want to add a couple of more because uh, I know that, you know, Moors and specifically Moors Americans, it's a lot of various different aspects that are impl- implemented uh, as far as the movement is concerned. So when it comes to the nationality IDs and, you know, the rare fingerprints and things that they, that have been uh, utilized from the sovereign citizens movement, uh, the world passports, you know, I've done all that. I still got, the, you know, my nationality ID for probably like 10 years ago, still at the house, got the world passport, you know, uh, I didn't, you know, it, it ain't too much that I haven't done when it comes to being a more, you yeah. know, I, I got the, the name correction done, you know, uh, so on and so forth. So just, just, I got to I just wanted to put that out there because I'm, and there was a time where I think I referred to myself as a Morris American, probably because there was a Morris organization that I was talking to one of the head guys in, uh, who was one of my teachers. And I was very interested. Um, I became very, I, I, I got very close to actually joining this particular Morris organization, you know, so, and it has, uh, you know, so, uh, it has Morris American within its title. So then I probably would have, you know, 
I, I can't remember for sure if I was referring to myself as a Morris American, but I was definitely considering being a part of a Morris organization that had American in its title. So I'm just saying that to say, to, to further expound on the fact that I do understand where y'all are coming from and I've been there, but as I evolved, I learned what, what works and what doesn't work and what's wait, what is a waste of time and energy and resources. So right. I just wanted to end it on that. Yeah, exactly. Um, this show, Road Pick Radio, is show is strictly dedicated to knowledge and information and that's why I ask you uh to participate on the shows because I know you and I know how in depth your knowledge is and you are more than qualified on these topics and subjects. And this show is this show has nothing to do with trying to be uh, popular and get millions and millions of followers and, and whatnot. Uh because sometimes the the, the truth the truth is is not well uh, accepted in these times. So, but we have a obligation and duty to drop the truth and let it roll where it roll. We not try. I'm not trying to be uh, famous and the, the most popular this and that and there. Nah, we want to get this. We want to present this education and this knowledge to the people with qualified people, you know, because I, I, I have that duty, you know, you know, to, to the people. I'm responsible for that. So I when I ask brothers such as yourself, Brother Low Key on the show, um, it's like the audience, I see them as um I gotta not not say have to protect them, not, not in that sense, but I have to make sure that that is it's right because you got a lot of curious people who wants to know, and I don't want to be the one who uh, kills their spirit with false information. You see what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Yeah, yes, yeah, sir. yeah. So that's why, man, I be whenever you come on and you and brother Jamal and brother Gino, and brother Marcus Mud, and uh, you know, uh, uh, rock conscious and 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 the supporters like Sonera Smith and I said, brother. Uh, Quavion and uh, uh, Catsy Rodriguez, who just joined, joined, subscribed, and everybody. Hey, right, we 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 family. We moving, meaning we growing in knowledge, man. Man, appreciate sure. you again, brother Low Key. Appreciate you, brother Black. Verpick Radio, we at.